Welcome to Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. The series that never ends because there's just so much to see and do. Even if some is harder to experience than others. But we make do. Last time we went through all of the level 50 main story quests and all the different requirements and needs we might go through on the way to reaching Heaven's Word. This video, meanwhile, is going to go over just about every last piece of optional content at level 50 for battle jobs. From listing out every single dungeon available, to finding out the extreme trials and where those come from. Maybe you'll find out something small you never realized existed or couldn't find. I'm going to specifically structure this one as best I can to group things together. All dungeons will be together and such, but there's some things to mention during dungeons that aren't strictly their own topic. Otherwise, each chapter will be about its own features 99% of the time. You'll see what I mean soon enough. Let's get sorting through it all. When we ended last episode, I was here at the Samurai Teacher. We're going to ignore him and go walk into my Grand Company. I went through Grand Company ranks up to Second Lieutenant in a previous episode, but one of the Second Lieutenant rewards is access to the Hunt Board with this quest, which is not quite the same thing as hunting. After a quick unlock, we can look at and take two sets of bills. The first is a set of five daily hunts, and they're pretty bad. It's a mix of normal enemies and fate-based enemies for very few seals. It's not worth it personally. The second bill, meanwhile, is weekly B-rank hunts. Pick this one up. While we're here though, head on inside to your squads and do some stuff with them. Trust me, they're worth it. Really. Hunt bills have no time limit and can be found at any time in your key items. They even come with a convenient button for opening the zone the hunt is in. So let's go there and look for it. B rank spawn? Anywhere. Well, they have a bunch of specific spawn locations. Sometimes only half the map has any spawn points for hunts, but most often the entire map is littered with spawn points for a hunt. 10 to 30 of them, depending on the size of the map. When you get close to the hunt, a notice will be posted on screen and in your chat of the direction the hunt is in, so you are given some leeway with finding said hunt. Then you just gotta kill it. Provided you are in some form of level cap gear, these enemies are explicitly meant to be soloed. You may want to pull out your chocobo companion for a little extra help if you're undergeared even a little, but otherwise these guys don't have much of a threat level. B ranks are always level cap and passive. They also have permanent uptime. Five seconds after killing a B rank, it will respawn elsewhere. Upon killing the hunt, you get 100 allied seals from the hunt bill. This is a lot, but sadly a once a week bill, but it's extremely cheap and easy 100 seals every week. I highly recommend doing it every chance you get, especially when we look at the rewards. A nice source of ventures for our retainers and a teleportation tickets. Each one of these completely negates all guild costs for a single teleport. They force an extra dialogue box every time you teleport, but the potential guild savings are huge, especially when we get into expansions and are doing 999 guild teleports across the world. This completely covers the hunt board, but not hunts entirely. Hunts are actually a separate concept to the hunt board, which is kind of confusing. You can participate in the hunt without unlocking the hunt board. You can even be level 1, a brand new character, and still get full rewards from hunting. B ranks only ever give rewards if you have a hunt bill for them, but there's two higher ranks of hunts. A ranks are bigger enemies who are level cap 
much like B ranks. But these guys aggro, unless you massively outlevel them, you're not going to stand a chance alone. They need a full party to kill or be massively overleveled. But again, as long as you join a party and even get just one hit in, you'll get the full rewards that the rest of the group gets. These guys spawn every few hours, four to six, after the last kill typically. They too can spawn basically anywhere on the map, wherever they have a spawn point. Then there is S-Ranks. These are extremely rare and highly coveted by hunters. When they spawn, they are huge, and there's even a notice in chat that says there is a rare hunt in the area. These have three to seven day respawn timers. On top of that, in the towns of the game, there are hunter scholars or similarly named NPCs that list hunt marks of his own, even the B and A ranks, giving a bit of lore on these enemies. The S ranks meanwhile, the lore is their spawn conditions. Yes, spawn conditions that must be met after their respawn timer has finished. In this case, Lampaloagra comes out when he notices battles happening. In this case, battles means leaves. Upon starting a leave, he will spawn, or at least has a chance to once the timer is up. Every S rank has a spawn condition like this. Some harder to do than others, some just automatic from game time happening. There are no hunt bills for A or S ranks, and they will give rewards no matter what. But moving on from hunts, we have the single longest series of quests that is not the main story. The Rise and Fall of a Gentleman. This questline has no less than 38 different quests of varying lengths across A Realm Reborn, Heavensward, and Stormblood, and a small cameo in a Shadowbringers dungeon. There's no telling when they'll add more. On top of that, this questline has four different trials to do, three in A Realm Reborn and one in Stormblood. I will not be doing this questline to show these off because it truly is that dense, but if you enjoy comedy or like unlocking trials, it's extremely recommended to do this series of quests. Moving out of Uldal, we return to St. Coinage's Find for a mini epilogue to the Crystal Tower series. And by epilogue, I mean an unlock for a repeatable quest. The rewards for this are kind of pointless for us as we are now, but we can come back here later and we might find a reason to be doing this. Just unlock it for now and save it for later. But while we're here, talk to Slafbjorn for an unmarked unlock quest. This is a short little quest to fix up your Magitek armor from the main story. Where before you were able to shoot cannons and guns, these no longer work when you mount up. This quest will re-enable those weapons, but without their offensive capabilities. Mostly it's there for if you want to shoot your friends with a bunch of fake explosions. Even if those explosions do no damage. But now, here's the first huge segment. Every single optional dungeon we can find. To start, we have Pyoreo in Uldah for Tam Terra Deepcroft. Hard. Unlike Trials, hard means nothing. It doesn't mean eight players like with Trials. It means this is the same tile set for a dungeon, but higher level slash gear level wise, and a new layout. Often, hard modes for dungeons are far easier than the original version. If nothing else, Consider hard to mean the sequel. Anyway, we can head over to Vesper Bay for two dungeons. Amdapur Keep from Nedric Ironheart and Wanderer's Palace behind the Waking Sands. These two in particular are very important, but I'll get back to that later. Next in Gridania Conjurer's Guild is the Lost City of Amdapur. Back to Mordona, we have a treasure trove of quests in the Seventh Heaven. Stone Vigil Hard, 
Hawk Manor Hard, Copperville Mines Hard, The Sunken Temple of Corn Hard, Holotali Hard, Brayflock's Longstop Hard, Holebreaker Isle, and Sestasha Hard, with two different quests we can't undertake yet as well. Something you may also notice while unlocking all of these is some of these quests end the moment you finish unlocking the dungeon. Others have the quest expecting you to complete the dungeon first. If you have room in your journal, which you probably do with 30 quest slots, keep these around even if you don't intend to do them now. 50, 60, 70 roulette is a huge boost to your poetics and some EXP gains whenever you need them, and it's probably a better option for clearing these out every day, instead of just trying to do them one by one. Moving on, if we end on Sestasha Hard's unlock, we end at Aleport for Pharaoh's Sirius and our final unlock. Now, I just got over saying to hold on to these and let the roulette send you to these mostly, but you may want poetics and doing some dungeons on your own time. In that case, there are five specific dungeons you should focus in on. The Wanderer's Palace, Amdapur Keep, Pharaoh Sirius, the Lost City of Amdapur, and Holebreaker Isle. All five of these, whether or not you have a quest for them, are important for unlocks later down the line. And specifically for right now, Amdapur Keep and Wanderer's Palace will allow us to return to the Seventh Heaven for Amdapur Keep Hard and the Wanderer's Palace Hard. Once again, feel free to hold on to these for now, or do them now if you'd really like to. 50, 60, 70 roulette is a very good way to slowly do these one by one, but you may eventually have to single them out down the line as the dungeons list increases. But dungeons over with, we can head back to Nedric Ironheart. He has for us the Weaponsmith of Legend. This is the A Realm Reborn Relic Quest, an extremely long, extremely grindy quest line for a single weapon that will be only slightly better than an ironworks weapon when it is said and done. Relics always and forever will be for glamour and only glamour. However, I recommend doing just the first step of this relic, a relic reborn. Go beyond this only if you truly want to. I recommend this first step though because of two unique trials to this quest line. A Relic Reborn Chimera and a Relic Reborn Hydra. For a tip or two for reaching this point, the Weapon Geralt request is a high difficulty level 50 craft that you can buy on the market. In Dragoon's case, a Champion's Lance. And for the trials, you may need to request some help from friends. Hydra especially seems to have issues coming up via roulette, but it's worth it for the roulette entry and helping other people down the line. Now let's take a short break for something more relaxing like housing. If you have a spare 500,000 gil, you can buy an apartment in any of the housing wards now. Or if you have a spare 3 million, 15 million, or 50 million, you can buy a whole house. Just uh, be wary of the fact that you're not the only one who will be fighting for the plot. The timer on the placard is the timer for when the price will go down, not when you can buy the house. There is an invisible timer for when a plot opens for purchase. So these three people will be sitting here for a very long time until one manages to buy the plot. So much for relaxing, huh? Alright, let's ramp up the difficulty for the next arc of this video. To start, we have the Wild Odin. He spawns around every three days or so, somewhere in the Shroud. The weather even changes to tension whenever he spawns. You have 30 minutes to find him and kill him, but you need a big group of strong players. 
You may even need to get a few people to help even find him, because when I say he appears in the Shroud, I mean any of the Shroud maps. North, East, Central, or South, and he doesn't appear on the map. You have to actively find the fate using your eyes and the mini-map. Don't try to fight him at low level or alone. His level scales up with successful kills, and he also will change appearance and name based on whoever dealt the killing blow last time. Shout out to you, Stella. Similar to Odin is a behemoth spawn in central Curthus. Near the entry to Snowcloak is a crossroads, with a northern road reading to the behemoth lair. The fate does not appear on the map just like Odin, and you must get close to see the fate. But he can spawn every few days in this crossroad. It's a two-parter two, with the second part happening up north in the lair. Rowena's girls in Mordona have uncanny knickknacks, and these are where you turn in the fate rewards for killing Odin and Behemoth. And also the Cascadia vouchers for bathing suits. But speaking of Odin, back at level 46, Orianger had the quest Primal Fear. This is an introductory quest line to the lore of Odin, and our intro to extreme content. The second quest in this line, if you lost track of it, is in the Seed of the First Bow in the Archer's Guild. From here, we finish the line and reach a dead end. None of these quests Orion Jair has is Odin. Return to Gridania and the Serpent Lieutenant Scarlet has two quests, one for Odin and one for Ramu. Let's quickly progress these up to their unlock points. Here's a weird little thing the devs have left around. Odin here was originally created to be a hard mode trial. It's even listed under Shiva, but below this is High End Trials. This is where Extreme Trials go. Both of these will have long queue times that will go into 30 minutes or even hours mark. And this is because both are actually Extreme Trials. And Extreme Trials are actually really, really hard. Odin is by far the easiest of them because he wasn't meant to be an Extreme Fight. But he hit still extremely hard, harder than some of the actual extreme fights. And intentions mean nothing when the fight itself is extreme level in power. And as far as roulettes are concerned, no extreme fight is in trial roulette. Instead, all extreme fights, including Odin, go into mentor roulette. And only mentor roulette. Say what you will about the system, I don't want to hear it, but your chances of normally queuing an extreme fight and doing it for real are low no matter what. Either get a group of seven friends to do it, or get carried with unsinking in Party Finder. Also, similar to dungeons, some quests will not complete until after killing the primal, and some will complete upon unlocking the trial. But let's go back to Urianger, and he has four quests for us. Mog X, Shiva X, Leviathan X, and Primal Nature. Primal Nature is the biggest quest, and has other connected quests. Quickly go unlock the other three trials, then head to Primal Nature, which will then lead into Garuda X. This one is an entire storyline, similar to the main story required storyline of the hard mode primals. First we have Garuda X, return to Urianger for Titan X, then one more time for Ifrit X. One more time, return to Urianger, and we unlock another repeatable quest, similar to the Crystal Tower one. We can get some glamour items out of it, but nothing much else. It's something there to do if you wish, but otherwise less important than the extreme trials themselves. Oh, and when killing Ifrit, I got a mount. Almost every extreme fight in the game, Odin, Mog, and Ultima weapon, which we'll get to in a moment, 
are the exceptions for A Realm Reborn. The rest have special primal mounts that play their themes when ridden. This is especially nice if you get sick of the chocobo music or any of the other mount music you have. Moving back to Mordona and the Seventh Heaven, the Bar Lady has two quests. One is Extreme Ultima, which you talk to totally not Yoshi P himself, and simply to die for. This is a very simple unlock for Diable Artifact Armor. This kinda isn't too amazing unless you specifically want this version of the Artifact Armor to be Diable. There's an Artifact set every expansion, plus we have the two sets from A Realm Reborn. Also, speaking of the second Artifact set, the I-90 set we got from the level 50 quest, can be repurchased here from Kakalan with the weird items you can find in some of the dungeons like Snowcloak. Overall, these are more optional than pretty much anything else just because, other than primal mounts, unless they're current extreme fights from the current expansion, there isn't much a reward for doing them. The content itself is the reason for unlocking. But for one final time, let's return to Urianger for Primal Awakening. We'll finally get the answer to the giant roar we heard after defeating Gaius. Yeah, that one. And meeting with a character we haven't seen in a while, Alize. Alize disappeared fairly early into the story and never came back. She's been busy and busy with finding the A Realm Reborn Raid series, The Binding Coils of Bahamut. Our first unlock of this will give us five instances, which will have 30 minute long estimated queue times, it's gonna be actually way longer, and fairly high gear level requirements. These will pop even less than extreme fights because they are a level of difficulty above extreme called Savage. Savage fights aren't even in Mentor Roulette. You will definitely need people to carry you, or a group of friends who are extremely willing to learn how to do harder content. And I do highly recommend at least finding people to carry you through this raid series, one fight at a time, as the story involved is extremely good and extremely important to the whole of Final Fantasy XIV. There's even a small dialogue change in Heaven's Word if you complete this series, but it's very small and inconsequential. The only required fights, though, are the 5th, 9th, and 13th fights, the last one of each individual raid tier. You'll have to go back to Urianger after each one to unlock the next. But also, if you want the story, do every single fight in order. There is story in each each individual part of the raid series. But there is one quest I won't be picking up involved this, but I will at least mention it. Second Coil Savage. This is more considered Savage Plus in difficulty, and is where the Savage difficulty's name comes into play. Back in A Realm Reborn, they didn't know to separate raid tiers and story tiers yet, but this quickly is fixed in Heaven's Word, so if you reach the Heaven's Word raid series, do that anytime you want. There's no worry about the fight being too hard to complete, like with Coils. And now for the finale. The jobs we can get. Over in Limsa, we have this yellow jacket unlocking Blue Mage for us, but this is not a job. It is a limited job. This distinction actually does matter a lot. It's because, as is explained, you must gain skills from fighting monsters rather than just learning them from quests and such. This is more an entire different content type than a job. You get an entire book of spells to fill out, gear scaling works differently to the point that weapons offer no stats at all, and leveling up is entirely based on mob grinding. Where mobs might give 200 EXP to a battle job, Blue Mage gets 20,000. 
In addition, you can't normally queue for dungeons as a blue mage. You have to have a pre-made party. You can't even do roulettes as a blue mage. This requires an entire guide on its own, whether by me or others, and tons of guides are already out there, but I won't entirely say no to doing my own blue mage guide in the future. Moving on to actual jobs, these two jobs are only accessible if you own Stormblood. In future expansions, this may come free with the base game like Heaven's Word, but as of making this video, this only comes with the current Shadowbringers expansion, and when 6.0 comes out, it will come with that expansion. Like Blue Mage, you will get a short preview of the actions you can do, and get a coffer of gear. But unlike Blue, you have a lot of skills to organize too. 50 levels of skills to go through, Go watch my guide if you need help. And then we come full circle, back to where this video started. This random citizen will give us Samurai's Unlock Quest. Head to Musasai, open your coffer, and put on your gear. This is how I will be entering Heaven's Word. Though looking a little bit different because I'm going to get some better gear. We first must take care of all of the level 50 gathering and crafting stuff, but for now, this is it. That covers everything I could find and remember to do at level 50. See you next time for... Finally Ending... A Realm Reborn. Thanks for watching this episode of Final Fantasy XIV, Your First Day. So much optional stuff edition. That took a bit, but not as long as I thought, but there truly was just that much I expected to need to go through. And I even still am not sure if I found it all. I feel like I missed one or two things on the battle end. This game is huge, and always new stuff is happening all the time. Blue Mage is a recent addition to the game, it wasn't always there for A Realm Reborn players. And there will come a day that much of this video may even become out of date because of even more additions that I'll have to add to the description. But that's what's so great about this game, there's a lot to do and no reason to rush through it all. I'm only rushing through it to catalog it for you to go at your own pace. I'm structuring things as I am to make sure I cover it all and in a way that makes general sense and is most useful to you. But ah oh well, next time I'm going to try and get all of the craft and gatherer stuff done as I said, and that one, oh boy, that's going to be rough. But take care, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Ethan Olson, Jamie Cotterell, Kathy Nock, and Melfi. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, the link is down in the description. Thanks for watching.